about RFID and physical security as much as some of the other sides of pen testing and of, of red team work. But making sure that no one is able to walk into your office is an important facet of InfoSec. Um, and honestly, mostly, I just think it's really cool. So a quick disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer and I'm definitely not your lawyer, but I really want to emphasize how important it is to know what you're messing with, research the legality, and generally stay on the safe side. Just like with any other type of pen testing or hacking or other circumventing of security measures, you have to be careful and cognizant of the legal boundaries. So this is not legal advice, um, and I'll give you the standard disclaimer that these views are my own, don't reflect those of my employer, but there are a lot of ways to get into RFID legally, and there's no need to break the law to do this stuff. So with that, let's get into it. So could I get, please get a show of hands. Who here has used RFID technology before? All right, so a lot of people. Who here has used it today? Okay, so not as many people. Um, thank you. RFID is used in so many different ways that odds are high that you've used it at least within the last week, if not this very same day. So it's used from anything from contactless payment, when you tap your phone to, to buy something at a store, to building access, to your hotel room, key cards, to inventory management, and so much more. RFID stands for radio frequency identification, or in other words, using radio waves to identify someone or something. At the basic level, RFID consists of a reader and a tag that use an antenna to communicate without any physical contact, for instance, like you would with a key, or line of sight, like you would with a barcode. Now, there are two main types of RFID tags, active, which has its own source of power, usually a battery, and passive, which doesn't have its own source of power, um, so no batteries, right? There's no electricity within those tags. Today, we're gonna to focus on passive tags because those are the most common in daily life and what you're probably going to wanna to be starting out with. So most people know about building fobs to get into offices or apartment buildings, but as I mentioned, these are also in your key cards, credit cards, clothing tags. This picture up here on the left-hand side is of the Uniqlo checkout, which if you haven't been, Uniqlo is a clothing store where you place all your items in these white bins and it'll ring everything up for you instantly so you can check out um, in the self-checkout. Now they have RFID in each of their clothing tags, which is how this is possible. Um, if you buy anything, any clothing at Target, they also have RFID tags in those, in those clothes as well. A friend of mine even found an RFID tag sewn into the lining of a backpack that he had, which was probably used for manufacturing or tracking during, during that process. So how does passive RFID work? Now, fobs like this one, as I mentioned, don't have batteries, neither do credit cards or these clothing tags, but it's still able to communicate without touching the reader. Now, I'm gonna simplify this a lot and stick to the basics, um, because like a lot of technology, there are obviously layers and layers of complexity and a lot of different types. But the best way that I've heard this concept described was um, from a talk at ShmooCon 2022 by Gabe Schuyler. And you can think of the reader as a lighthouse and the fob is a boat. Now the lighthouse can easily talk to the boat, right? It'll send out this light in Morse code or, or binary, whatever you want. The boat can see that and understand what the lighthouse is trying to say. But then how does the boat talk back without its own light source? Well, you give the boat a mirror. Now the boat can hold up at the mirror or put it down. The lighthouse can send out that beam of light and that's how the boat can then reflect that light back to the lighthouse so that you can talk to each other. Now, of course, this is a big simplification. The reality is a bit more complicated, but you get the gist. So a little bit more technically, how does it work? So the tag will have a microchip and an antenna at its base level. Um, the reader will generate an electromagnetic field so when you hold the, micro, the tag up to the reader and it enters that electromagnetic field that activates the antenna and essentially powers it, and that is how the tag is able to transmit data back to the reader. It's a little bit more like when you rub a balloon on your head and you can create that static electricity and kind of lift your hair up than it is like a mirror and a light. But again, these are just different ways to kind of think about the information. So there are, the tags operate at several different frequencies. Now you have the low, medium, and high frequencies, or in RFID, you would say low, high frequency, and ultra high frequency. Each of these have their own characteristics and strengths, as well as some weaknesses. 
So the low frequency tags are in the 125 to 134 kilohertz range. This is commonly what you would see for general just building tags, like building fobs and things like that. Usually they're lower security, but not always. And they're pretty short range. You can usually only read them from about six inches away from the reader. And importantly, they're also only able to do one-way communication. Now, the high frequency tags um, are, have a bit longer range, operate at a much higher frequency, 13.56 megahertz, um, as well as a bit of a range around there. And they're usually used for more secure access to control, some ticketing applications. Um, there are also high frequency tags and passports. Um, and now within the high frequency band, there are, there are, there's also the concept of NFC, which I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with NFC, which is near field communication. This is slightly different than RFID, but it is kind of under the umbrella. And that really relies on magnetic coupling, but it is kind of encompassed within all of this. Third, we have the ultra high frequency. Now this is mostly in the 856 to 960 megahertz range. Um, this does have a longer read range of, of about 30, up to 30 meters. Um, this, this obviously depends on the type of reader and the type of tag that you have. Um, it's generally used for more industrial purposes, things like asset tracking or, like I mentioned, um, that tag that was sewn into the backpack lining was ultra high frequency. Now, one of the disadvantages to this type is that it's very sensitive to liquids and metals. So because the UHF waves reflect off of or refract within these non-RF friendly materials, um, you kind of have to use shielding or mitigate environmental factors in order to use them effectively. That said, there are versions of this UH, of UHA, UHF tags that can be used in very high temperatures or embedded in concrete, things like that. Now, how do you tell the difference between these? Now, the easiest way is by sight. You can also, of course, use a reader um, or a different, to different tools to scan those tags and detect which frequency it is, but you can also look at them. So the low frequency antennas won't have space between the antenna coils. You can see there's the chip in the center and then the antenna around it. And if you hold a lot of tags up to the light, you can actually see these antennas through those tags. The high frequency will have space between them. You'll be able to see all the different coils. Now these can all be in the square shape, rectangular shape, or a circular shape. And then the ultra high frequency will look very different from the other two, generally looking like what that third picture is there. So here's an example of if you were to open up one of those cards, you would be able to see that antenna there. If you were to hold some, some of these tags up to light, you'd be able to see those UHF tags within. Another common way that you can figure out which kind of tag you're working with is it'll often have information printed on the tag itself, especially in cards. One of the more frequent ones you'll see is T5577. It's a very common type of tag. So if you see that information, some numbers and letters printed on a card, you can Google those, figure out what you're looking at. Now some tools you can use to get into RFID. Now this is not an expansive list, these are just some entry level things that you can get that are generally lower cost that are also pretty useful. So the first one is this RFID copier. Um, I'm not sure if it has an actual name or distributor, but you can just Google RFID copier or key cloner and reader, and you'll be able to find this on Amazon, on lots of different websites for about 15 bucks. You'll usually be able to get it in a pack with several different tags that you can play with. It's easy to use, but it's not necessarily the most effective and has fairly limited capabilities. So it can only really do the 125 kilohertz um, low security cards and tags, but I have read that sometimes it can do the 13.56 megahertz ones as well. Um, but I personally haven't used this one. It just is probably the lowest cost way to get into RFID. Now, one of my favorite tools is the Flipper Zero. You've probably seen these around if you've been exploring RFID. This is about $170, so a higher cost barrier to this. Um, pen testers, if there are any of you here, feel free to come and find me after this and tell me I'm wrong. But from what I've heard, this is not as useful if you're going to do actual red team or pen testing work. It's more of an interesting learning um, tool or some people call it more of a toy. That said, it is really fun to play around with and there's a lot that you can learn with this. Now, it has a lot more functionality than the reader that I showed you just a moment ago. Um, it does so much more than RFID. It also has the capability to do eye button reading and emulation as well as cloning. 
It can do infrared, which is really fun if you want to use it as a remote um, for your TV. It also has GPIO, so you can um, create your own customization. There are a lot of add-ons and tutorials that you can look up online. Now, if you were to invest in one tool to get into RFID, I would recommend the Flipper, just because it is a very low barrier to entry as far as your capability to be able to start using it. It's very easy, it's pretty gamified, actually, as far as the, the uh, UI goes. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, but, um, and it has a lot of different w avenues that you can go down. The other thing about the Flipper is it has a lot of community support, um, and you can, and lots of, you know, Reddit forums, it has its own, um, these are its own forums and lots of projects that you can get into. The third tool that I'll talk about today is the Proxmark 3. So the actual Proxmark 3, the RDB4, is about $200, $300, so even more expensive than the last two, but it is quite small. This is what, if you were actually going to go into pen testing or do this in the field, that's probably the tool that you'd be most likely, likely to use of these three. It's pretty small, it'll fit in your pocket. Um, you can easily switch antennas in the field. There are other um, modules that you can add on to it, um, and it has quite a bit of capability. Now, if you're not looking to maybe get that advanced right away, I would recommend going for the Proxmark 3 Easy, which will give you the high frequency and low frequency reading, writing, emulation, as well as some fuzzing and brute force capabilities. Um, I would just recommend make sure that you get the 512K version as you won't have the space to load your firmware if you get the other version of it. Now, I would also recommend um, being very careful when you're buying the Proxmark, there are a, there's a big gray market out there for these tools. So there are a lot of bad versions out there, versions that won't work as well, um, and versions that aren't really what they say they are. So just do some research before you get into it. I also have some resources at the end of this. Now, I would recommend, if you're going for the Proxmark, to go with the Iceman firmware. Um, Iceman is one of the kind of foremost names in RFID, especially when it comes to the Proxmark. Um, he's created a firmware that is um, fairly easy to use and um, works really well. You can get that just off of GitHub, and again, there's lots of support out there for how to use these, these firmwares and how to set up your Proxmark and get started. Now, another tool that you can use is your phone. Most phones these days have NFC capabilities. So you can use these um, with a lot of different things, but one of the main ways people use them are with these NFC stickers. You can get those super cheap online, like you can get 100 for, I don't know, 20 bucks, um, and there are lots of different ways you can get into it. So iPhones have, for instance, the shortcut function. You can use NFCs to set up smart home capabilities around your house. You can, Android has several different apps that you can even use to read and write MyFair RFID cards, which are slightly different than the, those um, NFC stickers. But it's a really cost-effective way if you just want to see what you can do with RFID and maybe set up a little bit of functionality in your house or just start some smaller projects. All right, some quick key takeaways from the talk today. So learning RFID can be expensive. You can certainly spend as much money as you want to on these tools. But you can also start out with less than 20 bucks and really learn a lot, have a lot of interesting projects to do. There are tons of resources out there for beginners and a whole community that's really excited to help you learn and grow. And there are also a lot of different applications and projects that you can use this for. Um, obviously, I mentioned the smart home. There are also many CTFs. And then if you want to get more advanced, you can get into actual red team pen testing use. So looking at cloning, looking at extended readers, so being able to read something from farther away, or even weaponization manipulation of those readers. And with that, I would like to say thank you all very much for your time. I do have here lots of really useful resources and links that helped me out when I was getting started. I will make these slides available on my LinkedIn page. So you can find me um, on LinkedIn at Clarissa Burry. You can find me on the social media platform formerly known as Twitter at Clary Explains. And I will also be here in Vegas all week here at the Diane Initiative, at B-Sides Las Vegas, and as well at DEF CON. Please come say hi, ask me questions, talk to me about what you're interested in doing. I really love this stuff. So thank you all, and thank you to the, to the Diane Initiative as well. Okay. I think we have a couple minutes for some questions, if anyone has anything. Yes. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, could you go to the mic, please? So, uh, 
I've been playing uh, around a little bit with software defined radios. So I have like the solar powered um, light set, it uses 433 megahertz. And I'm able to capture the signal from the remote. It's turning it on because I want to do some IF uh, TTD um, automation, but I can't replicate it. Is that something that the Flipper Zero could, could do or is that the wrong tool? Yes, yeah, so I believe so. That is not my area of expertise. Um, I would recommend asking uh, people at the RF Hackers Sanctuary if you're going to any conferences that they have. Or um, they also have the uh, RF Hackers, uh, they have a Discord, and there are a couple of different avenues there. So I apologize, that's not quite my area of expertise. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, when you moved it to an apartment complex that can do keep off instead of um, keys, and you kind of go, um, I don't know about this, and I definitely want to take the contact info because I'm going to talk to you about this. The guy, he told me they figured out how to open every um, door in the complex. Yeah. So just to repeat that into the mic, generally, oh, this was, this, uh, you were talking about um, how you moved into a building with a key fob as your key, um, and then you were able to figure out how to open all the doors in the building by looking at that technology and exploiting it. Is that a good summary? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, with that, thank you very much. Thanks for your time.